would like to call the March school board meeting to order at this time. Are there any adjustments to our evening's agenda? I have an adjustment uh, on our item number 10. It's not a new business item, it's an old business item and I'd like to move that up following item number seven. Dr. Pelletier, do you have a change? Yes, Madam Chairman. I'd like to uh, recommend that we move uh, item 13, which is a report on the FLEDS program, and 14, report on the eighth grade language arts, up to 5B, between A and B. Would that re reason possibly be so these teachers could go home and get yes. a nice rest? Right. We have a number of teachers and we'd like them to be as fresh as possible in the morning. Now, is there anyone here tonight that will be wishing to speak to the school board on an item that is not listed on our agenda? All right, then we'll move ahead to a, con to a, a consideration of the minutes of our February 13th, 1990 meeting. Are there any additions or correction to these minutes? I see I had one very small correction and that was the spelling of Mrs. Singer's name. I, I think that's not a misspelling. I think you actually was you weren't sure of her name and it's Singer, S-E-N-G-E-R. So let's correct that so we'll know that we have the right person uh, for that appointment. All right. Do I hear a, a motion that we accept the minutes of our, our February 13th meeting? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? All right. I will now move on to the business manager's report. Mr. LaBelle. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is not a quarterly report. However, should you have any questions, I will try to answer. Basically, the revenues are coming in pretty much on target at 68% to date, or $5.5 million. As to compare to expenditures to date, 63% uh, or $5.1 million. In, in the co-curricular under elementary that uh, have spent 100% of their budget, is, is there a problem for the rest of the year there? Uh, I looked at that account uh, yesterday, Jan, and I believe there is uh, probably $250 or something like that. There are three people that get a bi-weekly stipend of $20 or something like that. Everything else has been paid. What happened in that account, a lot of people uh, opted to receive the lump payment of $800 in advance or around the holiday time or something. As far as the federal and state programs, third page, we have anticipated or approved federal and state funds of $125,000. To date, we have received $68,000 and have expended $57,000. Uh, the state has revamped their, their payment system. Therefore, January and February has been kind of slow receiving payments from the state. They put in a new uh, computer system. But, you know, the, the regular monthly subsidy check as far as the regular education has been coming in. Other, uh, a lot of these uh, federal and state programs, uh, we should be receiving the money sometimes in, in March. The next report uh, deals with the food service program. And to date, we are experience a deficit of some $38,000. Uh, inventories as of February 1st as compared to the end of February were had a variance of approximately $500. Our inventories as uh, on February 1st were like $13,946. And at the end of the month, they were like $13,459. Unpaid bills at the end of February were $7,664. Compared to unpaid bills on the beginning in February were $15,544. Uh, 
what we'd like to, to propose to you people is, is uh, once we have finalized the general budget is to, is to set up a workshop with the board prior to some other meeting or something and have like a, probably an hour session and discuss or, or uh, kind of outline as to where we feel school lunch is going to be headed for come June 30th and, and outline next year's uh, budget for you people. We will be in the process of negotiations in the next couple weeks, I would say, with the, with the cafeteria people for next year's contract. Uh, tonight, on item, an item on the agenda, you will be asked to approve a, a raise in the school lunch prices from $1.15 to $1.25 in the K-8 hot lunch program. We anticipated or we projected that should that have occurred since last September, we would have realized a uh, $4,400 increase in revenues to date. Based on that, uh, it probably would have been looked at for uh, approximately six to $7,000 probably increase in the year. Another thing that we have, we will address in the, uh, in the budget, in the general budget, uh, relative to the school lunch program is that we will ask the board to approve a, a $25,000 funding in support of the school lunch program for next year. A lot of programs in the state, or I don't know a lot, but I'd say most of them, uh, are experiencing deficits in the school lunch programs due to the cost of uh, food prices have gone up, labor costs have gone up, Fringe benefits have gone up, along with uh, the state is, and the government, the federal government has, has kind of held back or, or slowed down the, the commodities that we used to receive in support of school lunch. And all those factors put together are, are not uh, healthy. Can I ask if, uh, these expenditures for food and, and non-food supplies, will that be stopping as we near the end of school? Should we, I mean, what's been the history of this? From March on, will those start slowing down? If not, we, if we have a $38,000 deficit right now, that, that will be much higher than $25,000. I would anticipate that March costs might not uh, slow down as, as, as we'd like to. However, April, May, and June should. As far as our, our buying power, we should utilize the, the, uh, the commodities as well as the food that we will have on hand so that you know, when we do end June 10th to 15th, whatever the last day of school is, that we have very little uh, usable foods and inventories. So your best guess is this number is not going to grow substantially from this point on? I'd like to, to, to assure you of that, but I don't know if I can. Well. My best guess, maybe Sue can help me out. My best guess is that looking at the numbers, I would dare say that hopefully that number stays where it is at $38,000. Well, that's what I was hoping, that that was not going to increase. Uh, it's. At that, at that workshop, we'll, we would like to, to have with you people is uh, we'd like to bring in last year's numbers too and, and kind of make a comparison as to where we were last year at this time, look at uh, the cost factors and you know, try to analyze the whole program. Okay. The next report you have before you is the community services report. I should start off with this one every meeting. This is realized revenues of $330,000 with expenditures of $222,000. And last but not least is the enrollments as of March 1st of this year. To date, we have 1,574 students in Cape Schools as compared to 1,571 last month. We have increased the one student in the first, second, and Two. kindergarten. kindergarten. Okay, any questions? <coughs> 
board. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, our comments by the high school representatives. I believe Jennifer's here and Peter was not able to come this evening. Jennifer? Um, so we're a busy time in the high school for various clubs and organizations. Um, a group of students have put together a production of Rage under the supervision of Mr. Mullen. And their first performance was last night. Several people attended. It was very successful. They'll take that, they will attend um, the regional one-act competition in York this Friday, where they'll compete against several other schools and hopefully go on to a further tournament. The students involved in the trip to France left February 14th, and they arrived back in Cape on March 7th. All students had a great time and seemed to be very successful. Some even got a chance to travel abroad with their, fam with their host families. Um, the French students will be, the French exchange students will be arriving April 2nd. So the high school is looking forward to them. The debate team has their state tournament this Saturday, so we're looking for some great outcomes in that too. The annual basketball boosters banquet was held last night at the Perputic Club, and the hockey banquet was also held last night. And it was a good chance for all the, the participants such as the coaches and the players to be honored. And it was very successful. Um, and the lacrosse team started yesterday. And all of the other teams, including the tennis, the baseball, softball, and track start next Monday. So we're looking for some great outcomes from them too. That's about all. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll now move on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Pelletier. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, we'll start this evening with the report on the eighth grade uh, educational assessment scores and Lyle Kramer is here to make that report. Good evening. The uh, main state assessment test scores were very strong this fall as usual. Um, in my memo, one of the first things I pointed out is a reference to page three. And I go over this each time because it, some people have erroneously reported that Cape Elizabeth does not test all of its students. And that's why we have such high scores. So I'd like to point out that we did test 100% of our students at the eighth grade level this year. The report doesn't quite show that because two students, one handicapped student and one other student, uh, did not complete the test, and that was reported out as, a, as an exclusion or a partial exclusion of the test. That's why the report doesn't reflect the true picture of what happened. But uh, all of our students were tested. The next set of figures that you have there are on page five. Um, those aren't too meaningful unless you do quite a bit of an analysis of this report. If there are any questions there, I'll be happy to respond to that. The heart of the report is really found on page seven, which reflects our school scores. Uh, this year in reading, the students scored at 395 on a range of 100 to 400, that is the very same score that they received, that a different set of students received last year. In writing, last year's score was 390, it was 345 this year. In mathematics, we've had about a four year history of 400. In science, last year they scored at 370, this year it was 345. Social studies, was 400 last year, 395 this year. And then humanities, uh, we received a score of 400 this year compared to a 400 last year. Do you folks have any questions there at all? Would you repeat once again what, what a significant change would represent? Okay, a, a significant change is roughly one standard deviation, which is 50 points on the scale. I should point out, too, that one standard deviation in the middle is quite a bit different than a standard deviation at the third st standard deviation above the average. Um, on a percentile basis, it would be about the 92nd percentile 
to the 99th percentile. That's the range that you're looking at on a percentile basis from 350 to 400. It would cover a much larger group of students if we move from like 250 to 300 up or down. The uh, diagnostic display that's found on pages 9 and 10, uh, that is mostly for uh, curriculum, that's listed mostly for curriculum purposes. Uh, the one that usually is down the most is in social studies area of main studies. And I think that one of the reasons for that is that we do a very extensive main studies program that starts soon after the tests are given. If they were tested now, I think it would be dramatically different from uh, the score that was given this fall before the unit was started. Then if we move on to page 12, uh, across the state, you've heard a lot of discussion about the gender gap. And in our school, it's, it is evident in a traditional fashion. You can see that there are quite a few more girls in this year's eighth grade class than boys, whereas at the state level, it's evenly split 50-50. Um, the girls usually do better than the boys in reading, and that's true this year. 373 compared to 400. In writing, the boys scored at 309, the girls 381. Uh, math, they both scored at 400. In science, there was a minimal, minimal amount of difference with the boys scoring at 359, the girls 340. In social studies, 400 and 397, with the boys scoring higher. In the humanities, the boys scored at 332, and the girls at 400. One of the things that does happen for our school is that any potential for greater gender differences is sometimes uh, covered up a little bit because of the very high scores. If uh, scores are running 395 to 400, and 400 is the top limit, there isn't much room for any differences. seems to be encouraging, though, that, that the girls in math and science are scoring as closely as they are to the boys. Right. I think that I've indicated to you folks uh, consistently before this that uh, although the girls in math and science receive a lot of attention, the biggest, biggest differences between the uh, scoring of the sexes is in the reading and writing mm -hmm. for the boys. Um, this is the first year that grade eight has been tested in a prior year at the fourth grade level. I did mention in my memo that I will do a comparison, if you would like, uh, ident by identifying the students who were tested in grade four and in grade eight. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I attended a state workshop uh, where they said that we should absolutely not compare the grades uh, the scores in grade four compared to grade eight because we have four sets of scores, or two sets of scores, including four groupings that are very different this year compared to four years ago. We would like for you to make the individual comparison. I, okay. I think that would be very helpful. It's the first opportunity we've had to do that. And if you'll just, I'm sure you have your own way of doing it, but take pupil A and show how th that pupil that was in our district did as a fourth grader and then how they also did as an eighth grader. I think that will give us a lot of information that, we, that, that you can use and that we can use also. Sure. You're talking about class rank in effect? Uh, uh, no. What I'm talking about is all the students who took these tests as fourth graders that also took them as eighth graders, we, they can be compared with themselves. In other words, if uh, when I mentioned class rank, I was thinking if student A was in the first position, the highest score in fourth grade, but only in the third position in eighth grade? Is that what you're getting at? Well, I, I just think it would be interesting to know, I think we may see a pattern that, that, uh, that their math scores, for the most part, or, or girls' math scores are higher as eighth graders than they are as fourth graders. You know, I think we, we may be able to see some patterns developing just by looking at how people 
did four years later themselves. Not a comparison with each other, not a comparison with the state. But I'm not sure what we can do with it. It would, would be nice well, to Well, let's know. take a look at it. It'd be interesting okay. to see how people you know, moved around if one that was in the middle of these results in fourth grade is all of a sudden at the bottom or the top of the list. It would be interesting to look at okay. what uh, I had in mind surprising was movement like that. What I had in mind is what they suggested at the state level. This is to pick an arbitrary uh, range of score of, say, five points. And for those students who have, between the two years, gained more than five points, you list that as a plus. Um, a student who has not lost or gained more than five points be listed as a neutral. And then a, p a person who has That's lost uh, more than five points over the three years then that be considered a negative and just count up the pluses, the neutrals, and the minuses, and the minuses in, in each of the subtest areas. That can only be done in the reading, the writing, and the math area because those are the only ones that have individual scores reported out. The other three, we do not receive test items, we do not receive individual scores, and those test items are not sent back to us and kind of classified because they use many of those over and over but I can do it for you in reading, writing, and math. I think that would also be interesting gender-wise, too. Not, okay. just, not just student by student, but do the girls do less well in certain areas, or do you find that the boys' language arts skills were declining? Okay. If so maybe that tells us about something that happens during those four years, that okay. maybe it's something we already know, but at least it would I'll try to have that for you next meeting. Thank you. It would also be interesting to just know uh, how many of the young people stay with us for four years. I recently read a study that uh, we keep a larger number than most people. I'm sure we so do. So the mobility here is not, apparently, I think you're going to find it's not as large as people say. I find it interesting that the state didn't want you to compare them and then gave you a way to compare them. I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I should Knowing comment, full well you're going to go out and do that anyway. Right, I should comment that uh, if we were to compare them, um, we would come out in a very positive way. I think that four of the six improved and only two dropped back a little. In, so. Since fourth grade? Since fourth grade. So we're not covering anything up. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Kramer. Item B. Madam Chairman, uh, the next item would be item 13 on the agenda, the report of the foreign language in the elementary school. And uh, Michael Ephraim, our curriculum director, is here. Michael. Do you have all your people here? Would you like for us to do the other before you? Perhaps they were arriving thinking it would be later on the agenda, is that? Well, if we could just go to eighth grade language arts. All right. We'll come back to foreign language when, when David gets here. Okay. So we're moving to item 14 on the agenda. All right. I'm going to move out in front of the screen here also. Okay, a couple of things. I'm hoping to be able to have some curriculum presentations for you uh, at each of the board meetings from, from now on, and we'll just take turns doing different pieces of curriculum and presenting them. And we're planning on doing, ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Too late, I'll stay with eighth grade language arts. <laughs> um, we have two, uh, curriculum presentations this evening and we're going to we, we've, we're going to try to keep the presentations to about 15 minutes okay even though we could potentially get into it much more but I'm going to try to limit it the eighth grade language arts team has been meeting regularly for about three months uh, and has now met with the entire eighth grade team to process uh, the language arts proposal that that uh, is being developed and has also worked with the eighth grade, with the entire eighth grade team as possible ways to implement and schedule this proposal that we're working on. 
Before we go any further in developing the proposal, however, we wanted to take it to you, uh, share our ideas and our thinking with you, and we'd like you to give us feedback sp uh, uh, about the state of our proposal right now. In particular, uh, we'd like feedback as to whether you'd like us to continue developing and proceeding in uh, continuing to define uh, and outline our new eighth grade program. And if you give us permission to proceed with the development of this program, we'd like uh, your input on areas that you'd like us to focus on and be concerned about as we can continue to develop the program. Okay. The implementation model uh, that has been developed now by the entire eighth grade team uh, goes like this. We're going to have two teachers working together as a team. And the, uh, there'll be three sections, three sections of eighth grade language arts. And the teams will be, uh, uh, Hope and Linda will uh, team to teach two of the sections and Hope and Mary are going to be teaming to teach one of the sections. Each one of these sections would meet in 80 minute time blocks and would meet with uh, two classes of students. So, so it would be a group of 37 to 40 students meeting in 80 minute time blocks with a team of two teachers. This structure uh, is going to allow us the creativity uh, and, ability, and ability to begin individualizing that will result from longer periods of time and faculty teaming. Okay? And now I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the language arts team. Uh, Michael has let is going to let me speak for a few moments, but he has a hand signal for me when I go over three and a half minutes. Uh, because most of the time we want the eighth grade teachers to have an opportunity to talk to you. One of the things that we looked at is um, currently the status of eighth grade language arts. And right now, eighth grade language arts, the eighth graders choose any two of the following, an English class, a reading class, writing literature, or foreign language. So that's the current situation for eighth graders. As Michael mentioned, we began meeting back in December, and we had several different issues that the team wanted to talk about. And one of them was some looking at that current status of what we were offering. And they had some concerns about our, our current programming. And some of those concerns were that some of the students looked upon our four offerings as a way of tracking. Some classes were thought to be easier than others, and some were the real hard classes. So to some students, and to some parents, it looked like we were tracking the eighth graders. That is not consistent with middle school philosophy. Also, in our classes, some of the students weren't challenged. And in other classes, some of the students were in over their heads, and it was too challenging. For instance, in our writing literature course, which is a very popular course, we do not emphasize in that curriculum a lot of instruction on usage. And yet, many of the students who are in the class have demonstrated through their writing that they needed to have more instruction in usage. So that was a concern to the teachers. Also, the present structure isolates the language arts into separate components that the students perceive as there's a, when I'm in reading class, I read. When I'm in English class, I study grammar and some of the stories in the anthology. When I'm in writing lit, I write. And when I'm in foreign language, I study a foreign language. And what we're trying to aim at is to get them to look at all the arts of language and to really look at usage and oral expression and writing and the study of literature as well. So those are were one thing we were looking at. <clears throat> also, our current structure isn't consistent with our move to whole language and process-oriented instruction through the elementary grades and up into the middle school. So we were trying to think of a design that would be more consistent with our present thinking and also with the present research on process-oriented instruction. Many t right now, the English classes are based with an anthology, and therefore that sometimes limits the literature choices that they can make. Um, as, we've mentioned, as I mentioned already, writing lit right now focuses a lot on um, analysis of quality literature and some challenging writing assignments, but does not emphasize usage instruction. 
and we didn't want students to miss that part of instruction because that is an important part of process writing instruction as well. And also, right now, none of the courses that we offer really has a solid emphasis on oral expression. And this has been a need that we've seen for several years and we've kept talking about we need to get more speech in there. We need to get debates into our programming. And we hadn't been able to work it in yet. So as we were looking at a new design, we said, okay, we really want to make a plan that will include oral expression as a strong component for our language arts offerings. This brought us to some of the designs that the teachers are going to present to you. And right now I'm going to turn it over to Hope is going to present to you first and then Mary McGuire and Linda Hull are going to present to you a working plan that they have. And after that, we'll be glad to um, take any questions that you have and certainly share our answers to date with you at this point. So right now, I'd like to turn it over to Hope. is the planning that we've done to date. I've covered it. <laughs> and um, we'd like to start with the, the planning process, because we have developed a schematic that I think would give you an overview of the program. And incidentally, also, is a planning format for teachers, because it allows us to look at all the components of the program at one time with the exception of the outside reading, which will be expanded on um, a bit later. The schematic that we've developed allows us Um, the schematic that we're using shows you the components that, Mar uh, that uh, Nancy referred to in that we want to be sure that the program covers um, the areas of English usage with every student, um, literature, writing, and the oral expression. And the way in which we've tried to develop the program, or the proposed program, is to deal with the usage through the student's writing, meet the student's needs, in other words. Um, what seems to be apparent in their writing that uh, they need uh, to work on. We also want them to, uh, for every unit that is developed, to involve uh, literature activities, writing activities, and oral activities. And so the plan that we, that we have placed um, on this overhead really shows all of those components. Um, it allows us to look at a unit theme, and um, Linda will explain to you how we would develop those unit themes and what, what the various components would be um, in, in their developed form. It would allow us to take into account students' learning styles, uh, because the various activities that we would design would, would try to meet those learning styles. And it also would um, give us the opportunity to involve them in outside reading, which ties in with the literature th themes that we're using. Um, it would be necessary for me to point this out to you, so let me just take a minute to do that. You'll notice that we have um, the objectives and the evaluation for each of the activities under a particular unit theme. Then there would be 12 activities here that would provide um, choices for the students. 
in each of the learning style areas. Um, the uh, ST or um, factual approach to learning, um, the SF, the personal involvement with literature, with writing, the NT, which would refer um, to the analytical kind of activities, and then the NF, uh, which really looks at the cre more, the more creative kinds of activities. So those activities would be provided. And on this theme sheet, and I have to slide it up here so that you perhaps can see that, um, there would be various activities that would be developed. And for every unit, there would be the assignments and activities for the theme, novels and stories for the literature introduction, introductory lessons in the theme itself, in the literary concepts we would be emphasizing uh, at that particular point, and the usage lessons that uh, would meet the needs of the students at that point. And they might be grouped in whole class groups, smaller groups, depending on the, on the needs that we see. Um, and then the procedure for these choices would be that we would do an introductory act activity for the unit, and it would include reading, writing, oral, every student would be exposed to that. Then present activities and assignments and methods of evaluation that would be represented here in the activities that we would develop. That would be for all students. They would make choices of one of each. One literature activity, assignments back down so you can see it, one writing activity, and one oral activity for that particular theme unit. Uh, now Linda's going to talk to you about how some of those components would be de developed. Um, Linda and Mary right. okay. together. Well, first of all, we're really excited about um, the chance to maybe have a new program. We are, have not been um, totally satisfied with what we've been doing in the last um, few years. That we're, we're not meeting, in some cases, uh, the individual need. Um, and being um, in the, being a holistic language approach, we're going to be able to inter, integrate and intertwine the, the language usage, the oral expression, the writing, the literature, the outside reading. All, all the students will, will get all of this. And through team teaching and that block, that 80 minute block, we feel we'll be able to give the support, the guidance, and the time necessary for the cooperative learning to take place, the enrichment activities, student teacher exchanges, and also the teachers bouncing ideas off each other, which I think we'll all be better teachers in the end for that. And I think, as uh, Nancy said, this program as it is now is looked on as tracking. And that's just um, in opposition to what the uh, middle school philosophy is. And to, de de visit, to develop a positive self-concept, we can totally individualize with some good record-keeping um, strategies and focus in on um, the different needs of the kids. We can uh, do, we can also stretch the kids, the kids who really need to be challenged. I think we'll show you how we can take one unit and hopefully meet everybody's needs. Okay, briefly to fill you in a little bit more on the schematic and the rationale part, um, what we hope for the usage instruction is that each student will be given periodic writing samples throughout the year and the writing prompt will stress what we're trying to measure so that if we are indeed testing mechanics then the students will know that and be able to do that. The writing samples will be done within the classroom. They may be rewritten, they can do a final draft, but they will be done within the classroom. Then from that, we will measure students and group them according to individual needs and what we see that they do not know in their writing. Um, hopefully, the teaching also will come from their writing so that we'll, rather than having them do exercise practices that students know exactly what they're looking for and do very well and then don't carry over to the writing, if we take the writing to them and direct the exercises that way, hopefully we'll see some real improvements in writing. Those will be done as mini units and they will be semi-individualized in that only the groups of children that demonstrate a need will be the groups of children that will be having those particular units. And that will change throughout the year so there will be different units. Students will be directed to work rather than with two or three then they'll have possibly 39 other students that they will interact with during the class. And we will chart the progress that's being done. <coughs> 
In addition to that, the courses will be built around the themes. And we brainstormed several different themes. Linda's going to give you some more information on that. We hoped that there would be 12 to 15 themes a year, and they would last anywhere from one to four weeks. The introductory unit would have common literature for the children, writing assignments, and oral activities. In addition to that, there would be a core of knowledge that we would want all of the students to have. At that point, they could go off and choose some of their other choices. And again, the choices would be in areas of oral expression, written expression, and literature. Um, in choose, each student will choose at least one activity. The reason we decided at least, there were some students who might be really excited about some of the units that we do and want to do some extra work in mythology or some extra work in historical literature and that's always an offering then also there would be certain students that we would require that would do certain things because they have different needs and we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all those students um, all activity areas would contain the objectives the materials the activity and the and the evaluation so students will know in the beginning what's expected of them and what will be accepted in addition to that, we want students to maintain their writer source notebooks. And in those notebooks, they'll have journal entries, um, responses to readings that's teacher directed, and pre writing activities, and other activities that we may do in class. And finally, the final component is all students will be required to read at least six books as outside reading. And those books will be followed up with projects, conferences, and writing. And the books hopefully will also be expanding on the literary themes that we're using in class. Some of the reading will be free choice, others would be teacher directed, and hopefully to expand students' exposure to various types of literature. Linda's going to direct you in some of the activities that would be possible by doing this. Thanks. Some of the theme units that we brainstorm, um, just prejudice, historical views, real experiences, myths, survival, nature's way, suspense, conflict, coming of age, generation gaps, et cetera, et cetera. And focusing on, say, uh, the theme of conflict um, to present varying degrees and depths of literary study, there will be two classes going on at the same time, two different teachers that can in interact at all times. And, and in, during the introduction, I think we need to have a high level of expectation of, of a central core of knowledge of what we want all the kids to be exposed to. And uh, for example, um, if we were doing conflict within plays and drama, uh, some kids could take uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth and focus in on the monarchical struggle, the man versus man struggle there, using the language of Shakespeare. Other kids at the same time could be reading maybe the diary of Anne Frank and focusing on the Nazi and the Jew struggle. And a third group could be doing a raisin in the sun, the black-white struggle. And they are different uh, degrees of depth and um, difficulty. And what I see so exciting with this block scheduling is after the kids have gone through this and, and done some um, research and insight into these various things, they can kind of share, do some cooperative learning, and do some comparing. And in that long block, we can flip-flop um, with each other and really end up teaching more, more children what we want to learn in a short period of time. And um, I just see a lot of the enrichment exercises that follow the introduction to the themes where they can choose according to their learning styles um, is going to be more relevant um, and where we're, we're really focusing in on keeping track of who's doing what and who is good at what we can one of the teachers can break away and say these groups this group really um, have outstanding writing skills and uh, developing uh, maybe plots and discussions of, of from the various plays and really can can work on together in the in their particular skills and helping each other and uh, kind of prod each other along in areas that they're a little bit behind in 
questions? Okay. Nancy, do you have a few more things to say? Or um, no, I don't have anything to say. We just wanted to know if you had any All questions right. that you would like to ask the team. Okay. Questions from the school board? Will this be handled in one large classroom situation with two teachers or two separate classrooms? How do you plan to handle the space? Handling the space. <laughs> Would one of you like to answer that? Well, we're hoping. You we're might hoping. want to come up to the oh, microphone. Okay. <laughs> we're hoping for two rooms, maybe the room that um, Charlotte, Hannah, and I are in 211A, and uh, Rowley's room, which was the science room, and it's been cut in two. We'd like to have um, a gothic arch put between the two <laughs> and to get us in the flavor of, of England and that sort of thing. But we're thinking that maybe these two rooms, we are going to put an opening between the two, perhaps. That's one thought. So you, you definitely would need to, to do some structural changes mm -hmm. to get yourself mm -hmm. a room. So. Yeah, the design is, is for them to be in one space where they have access to each other, not crossing the hall or, or anything like that. But we will have to work on that. And that the eighth grade team will have to help decide, too, how to, the entire eighth grade team, how to use their space. So they could move from room to room. Exactly. Children would, one group of children, children would be blocked into one room, and another set in another. They, they will move back and forth. That is correct. I think with the design that they showed you, a lot of flexibility of movement and freedom of choice for students with teacher guidance and high expectations. So in a, in a two-team teaching, will one teacher concentrate on one certain area of, of the project, or will that? I think that would vary from unit to unit. It would be depending on the content of the unit, uh, and the teachers would decide that when they plan the unit, who will handle which parts uh, of that particular unit. But I don't see two teachers each working with a certain group of youngsters in that block time for the whole year. Um, nor do I see just one teacher teaching the usage units, for instance, or only one teacher teaching the literature units. I think that, that would be a, a shared responsibility. Where, where does foreign language fit into this? You mentioned that as one of the four. One of the, the things we were trying to do, Loretta, is be a little proactive, too, because in the 91-92 school year, by that time, with the projection of foreign language, all eighth grade students will be taking foreign language. Next year, as it has been in the past, some of the students will choose that. And we were looking for a way to still have a quality language arts program and also a quality foreign language, uh, foreign language program and not have one take time away from the other. So is that part of that 80 minutes, the foreign language? No, it is not part of the 80 minutes. That is another class period. So if you take someone out of the present schedule 80 minutes, then what must they give up? Would they be giving up foreign language? For instance, now, that, that's two periods. You know, one period might be writing like one period. Part of, and that's where they took it to the entire eighth grade team. And I'm sure these people will correct me if I'm wrong instantly, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but that they took it to the team to how they would divide the schedule up so that all subjects could be taught and no one would be out of any class at all. What this is going to do is it's going to offer an 80-minute language arts period for all eighth grade students. And, what and will they, they will still up? have foreign language. They won't be giving up anything except perhaps, I think, is it a, a study time or something like that? Um, the break time that we had uh, thought about instituting, which would be a, we had thought about using 20 minutes of break time that also would be used for, uh, as an activity period uh, or perhaps uh, student council meetings or that kind of thing. That, will not, that would preclude that uh, possibility. But it looks as if we may be able to work that in as we have this year um, on the opposite times from the AD, um, the advisor advisee time. So um, we have, uh, you probably are aware of it since you have a daughter in the eighth grade, that we have two shorter periods in the morning academic block and three very longer, much longer ones in the afternoon. And this really, what it does is more equally divides that time. So there would st it would still be an eight period day? Yes. As you have now. And it, one of those periods is, is lunch, is that correct? That's one uh, of the eight period? No, it's no. a nine period. Okay, it's a nine period day. So, so you would have the same number of, of periods each day with the but same. The time would be redistributed in such a way that we can get, um, they would be a regular period, single period, would be 40 minutes, but this 80 minutes would be a, a, a double 
This sounds very individualized. Why are you not individualizing now? The things that you're planning to do that seem to be needed, why aren't those being done now in, in your smaller classes? If, if you see a disparity between some young people who are in writing lit that are struggling and some who are not struggling, are you not providing, able to provide yeah, those now? But, but how, how can this change that? I, I guess I'm having trouble understanding how two people with 40 students can address something that one person with 20 students couldn't presently be doing if I they think just it's because, I think it's because of the integration. You are integrating all of those components uh, in the design of the course. Those components are not all integrated into the design of the courses that we have presently. But is that because there doesn't seem to be a need for some of those parts. For instance, some no, people No, the, the need is definitely there, but it is not a part of those courses, and, and the redesign takes that into account, I think. Other question? Jan? Um, I think it sounds wonderful. I, I hope that it, it, it can work. I always, each year, get a chance to talk about record keeping, <laughs> this is my chance. I, I, I'm, I hope that that's been a real carefully thought through, it sounds like it has, part of it, because once again, I think that that's the real key to it, that you know, if you don't know where the kids are in each part, then this can become a mishmash of, of things. So you do have definite record keeping ideas in mind? And, and that's the way I'd phrase them right now, Jan. We have ideas right now in, in the budget we have budgeted for three work days this summer and talking with the team as recently as this morning, one of the major things that we want to handle on those three days is to talk about different management systems and to constantly work in throughout the year frequent meetings where we are constantly asking ourselves, do we have accurate enough records for every single student to know where they are with their reading activities, with their writing progression, with their oral expression? How are they analyzing literature so that we can have all of that readily available? There's not one program out there that works for everybody, and a lot of people who are involved in process education are trying to find the answer. Um, these people are certainly, that's the exact question they brought up today, and they've got some possible answers and some ideas for answers, but it is a prime concern for them as they begin to develop the course. Are you shooting for the follow, this coming school year or the year that the foreign language is offered to everyone? We're, we're hoping to start this in September 1990. September next year. Charlie? I'm going to ask the nasty question. Is it, what additional cost to the existing program do, will this add? The additional cost, I believe, is the one that Chris has already proposed to you in his budget proposal, um, increasing Linda from half time to three fifths time. And I believe that's the only additional cost. Nothing in curriculum material? Well, other, other than curriculum material that we would have, we've asked for, for monies, but we would just spend it perhaps in a different way. But, but you could integrate some of the curriculum materials you already have. Oh, yes, in yes. Okay. I, in fact, the, um, the list of uh, themes, we leaned heavily on the materials that are presently available knowing that we would add to those from what we have budgeted for materials for next year. But uh, if you look at those, you look at our anthology, the units that are presently being taught, that's where uh, many of the ideas for the units have come from. So the materials are there. I just wanted to make a comment that if this works well, I think it would be really exciting to see it extended so that other subject areas become part of it as well and, and it all makes sense to kids and ties in with the music and social studies and all the other areas as well. Michael, did you want to? Um, and any other questions? Well, we'd like uh, Okay, what we need to do then, if, if, if this is okay for us to proceed, is we actually now have to start uh, building the units and beginning to devise the monitoring systems. 
I mean, the real nitty-gritty of, do, of doing the courses. And as we proceed doing that, our next, our next interactive steps are going to be to um, uh, begin sh uh, have, a, have a meeting with seventh grade parents and begin to change the new structure, explain the new structure to seventh grade parents, because it's a fairly dramatic change in eighth grade language arts, number one. And then also, at some point, we need to sit down with the high school and begin coordinating this uh, eighth grade, ninth grade high school transition. So these are all the next steps. Um, we do have a mock-up of how the schedule for the whole eighth, for all eighth grade subjects would, would, will flow. And, and if, we had, if we had that more precisely articulated, you would have seen much more clearly how students fit in all their subjects with, with the 80-minute block. Um, that's the piece that we'd work harder on in getting ready for a seventh grade parent uh, presentation also. So beginning to design the nitty gritty of, of, of the themes, uh, th tapping on some of our resources that have been developed in uh, some of our whole language classes at other grades, wh which have devised, are beginning to devise management record keeping systems for a program that gets much more literature-based and self-selected and much more individualized. I mean, there's a lot of resources right within our system for how to do that. Those are our next steps. So, shall we proceed? Let me ask, I have still a couple more questions. No, go ahead. Are any of the classes going to be shortened because of this? They're, they're no. really, they're picking up 40 minutes. And I was under the impression that the eighth grade had very little time this year of for even to eat lunch, they don't go outside. Where are you, where are you getting this 40 minutes? I, I'm, I wish we had a schedule or something that could, you're not shortening math, is that correct? You're not shortening any of the other basic subjects? No. It's like, a, it's not a 42 or 43 minute class right now? It will continue they to be? They are a 42 or 43 minute class right now. With this design, with the overall design, they're 40 minute classes. So you are gonna cut? That, that is correct. Seven and a half percent of the time from those classes. Well, I, 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 is that much time? Well, um, I, I know that for, it's a, it's 43 it's to 40. It's a redistribution of the time that the eighth grade team looked at and um, felt comfortable with. And I mean the entire eighth grade team, not just the language arts teachers. But the instructional periods are 40 minute blocks, with the exception of language arts, which is an 80 minute block. Th they do feel comfortable with cutting math, because I was under the impression that that it's I, a real struggle to get through the program. I think that, that would be a question for the math teachers to answer, but Mary, because I don't you're a math teacher. Say I feel comfortable. You're still there? The um, I think the structure is that the math has been cut anyway. Yeah. 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 You know, the first design that we drew up uh, had math in double periods also. And uh, in pulling that off, we would have needed another staff person. And so we put it aside, figuring that that just wasn't going to be in the works. But in fact, the first way we drew this up had language arts and math double periods, but that would have cost an extra staff. And, and so we moved back away from that. Um, and I think that probably would have been our first choice, but chose not to go that way because it cost too much. Well, don't you have to also have to look at the changes that you're making in the math program in the high school before you, with the, with the, we talked about text the other night, at, and that, changing that program and how that affects eighth grade and seventh grade and the texts that are used there, I mean, doesn't that all have to work in together? Would it be a little sure. premature to change eighth grade at this point? 
in math? There's, there has been another change in eighth grade math that we've <coughs> done this year, and I'm thinking about when, when to give you a report on that. But, but you're right. I mean, we'd look at math in the context of everything we're trying to do in math, for sure. I think quality of time is, is important here, too. If, if the 80-minute period is going to be much, a much higher quality time for the students than two 42-minute periods, I, I would be in favor of that. Also expecting that the other periods that might be a couple minutes shorter would be of the, that high quality as well. The, the one suggestion I have when you approach the parents is that you be sure to explain to him to them how this challenges all the children because all, you you speak of children being not challenged and you speak of children being in over their heads and sometimes a program can challenge no one it's just there and you can just lose yourself and and it has the defined expectations are not high. I, I, I think this program done, done well, and I think you're certainly the team to do it well, uh, should be able to, to alleviate fears in people. And I suggest you spend quite a bit of preparation time explaining to them how it's going to be best for all children. Okay, shall we, are we in agreement that they can proceed looking into this? This is not a, you're not expecting us to say, this is the program for next year. Are you asking us to do well, that well, tonight? Let me, well, let me ask you do, you, do you want us to come back and report again I do. when we get this more developed? I don't know if others do, but I think to present us with something we had no material on the first night and okay. ask us to endorse that as the program for next year. Particularly after we've just spent two nights staying till midnight. This is our third <laughs> night in a row. <laughs> We're going to hit you when you're down. Let's look at it again. <laughs> Especially, though, I haven't seen the budget item for the Gothic arch yet. <laughs> I'm concerned that the program can't work without the arch. It's coming. No, for that reason, I wanted just sort of a, a reading on, on whether we should proceed or not. But I think we should come back when we have more materials and when we have the schedule laid out. Charlie? I'm a little concerned about a break. I've heard that the, the stress on the eighth grade this year because <coughs> of the short lunch period, no, no time to get outside and get some fresh air during a whole period of day. Well, how does this impact? You're going to take away the 10 minute break that they have in the afternoon. I hear, you know, then I hear that the lunch program, that they don't have enough time to get down to lunch and eat lunch and I just, I don't want to add some, one more stress to their, to their day. Actually, this is only our second night in a row. <laughs> For me, it's the third it night in like a row on, on a different subject. <laughs> um, I think that the way in which a middle school schedule um, is set up is in blocks. We're talking periods now because that's the way we've been thinking. But if we look at a block schedule, and to, just to give you an idea of the proposed schedule and what we'd like to see happen, um, it would mean that students would, would go to an advisor advisee group, which in turn becomes their home room, which is a, a good combination, we feel. And then um, there would be two of these 80-minute blocks, which in essence is 160 minutes um, for academic uh, subjects, what we call our academic block. It is up to the teachers in that block in a middle school environment to decide how to use that time. And if kids are experiencing stress, you may be sure the teachers probably are too. And uh, because we keep in touch with our advisees, and that is the, the means through which we've done it this year, uh, we will deal with that time in a flexible way. And I think we have to, have to look at that. That is, that is middle school. And that is um, what we would hope to be able to do with that. If we looked at those four periods, and then a break, I say a break because it's a different kind of activity, of another 80 minutes of allied arts, a lunch break and then allied arts, and then another academic block of just 80 minutes in the afternoon. That's a, it's a really good way to break up the day. It also allows us some flexibility within those blocks to, to 
schedule a break if we feel we need it uh, or whatever else is needed. So I think that that's the approach we, that we probably would take with that. Okay. Does that, that answer answers. your question? A circuit breaker is what I was looking for. Yes. <coughs> Any other comments? I'd like to make just one comment. I'm uh, very pleased with the enthusiasm the teachers have. One of the things that I see that could be very beneficial, and I would think in a community such as this, as you theme, and I couldn't help but uh, hear some of them, particularly the conflict one, I'm certain there are resources in this community that could add significantly to a program Con like to the that. Conflict? <laughs> I'd be more than happy to spend, help you with the conflict portion. <laughs> uh, will you be back with, in touch with us in a month? Yeah. Um, Is that too soon? When should we come back? Yeah, you, you, you'll, within a month? You'll okay. circulate a packet ahead of time. Yeah, it'll be nice to have Yeah, we, we have to give you stuff beforehand. Okay. Thank you. Foreign language? Okay, foreign languages. Um, a foreign language committee has been working all year long, and it's made up of all our foreign language faculty. Our four uh, FLESS faculty, Elizabeth Kelsey, Suzanne Janelle, Barbara Cannell, and Sue Leonard, and our four high school facul faculty, Juan Perez, Alfredo Paletti, David Peary, and Judy Liberty. Um, we've come together as a K-12 foreign language faculty in the uh, design and planning for the new grade seven and grade eight foreign language program. As you know now, we now have FLESS being offered FLESS stands for foreign language in the elementary schools. We now have FLESS being offered at grades four, five, and six. We have the high school program nine through 12. The design and work of a seven and eight program has allowed us to come together uh, as a team, designing that program together and in the process of, of it being a mutual program designed both from the FLESS end and the high school end we have started the work on establishing the coordinated program that has to emerge out of this. Okay? Um, part of what's happened as we've done this is that uh, the team has spent time uh, in each other's programs uh, there's been a real coming together and working as a team. That's going to allow the basis for the development of a really strong seven and eight program, and it's also going to allow the basis for um, the reworking of FLESS and the high school program that'll happen as, as these two programs begin hooking up and, and getting coordinated together. That's been an, a very exciting development as people have gotten closer to each other's programs and have really joined in an effort to design the, the link in between. Okay, now having said that, I'm going to turn this over to Barbara Cannell, who's going to walk you through the first part of this, which, which is going to be talking about implementation. Not knowing exactly how Michael was going to introduce this, I'm sure that some of my remarks will be a bit of a duplication, but if I skip the first two paragraphs, you probably won't know where we are, so I'm going to start right where, from where I, I began. I've been asked to speak with you regarding the implementation of the FLESS program, where we are right now, and what our expectations are for next year. This year, Spanish and French are being offered in grades 4, 5, and 6 through the FLESS program. In grades eight, 98 students are taking French or Spanish for the first time in what is our traditional entry level course, equivalent to French or Spanish one at the high school level. And you can see that on the overhead or it was included in your school board packets, I believe, under 1989-90. We're in grades four, four with French, five with Spanish, 
in sixth grade with the second year of French, and then in the eighth grade where it is their first year in the program. When classes began this September, we anticipated a need to review much of the material that we covered last year, but surprisingly that wasn't necessary. The students' retention over this summer was really remarkable, and we were able to begin almost immediately building on what the students learned last year. 60% of communication is listening, and in the first year we emphasized listening comprehension. This year we are focusing on increasing students' language production. In the first year, one-word responses were acceptable. This year, students are encouraged to answer in phrases or in entire sentences. They are forming questions in addition to answering them. They're working frequently in pairs or in small groups in the classes in order to capitalize on class time so that they have lots of opportunity to use the target language. We're integrating our foreign language classes with the cu classroom curriculum wherever possible. When we use the target language to communicate content, students learn the content and almost coincidentally they are, in, they are developing their language skills. We're seeing that when the message is meaningful, the students are more highly motivated and really try to understand it. Geography and math are two curricular areas where we've done some content-based instruction this year. Teaching vocabulary for words like rivers, boundaries, mountains, ocean, and sea comes naturally when the students are involved in learning the geography of a given area. In fifth grade, we've studied the geography of South America and have begun to study the geography of Europe. This is an area where I'm not actually integrating with the classroom because they're not doing that in fourth grade and they are not doing it in fifth grade. It's supplemental. Integration of math skills, factoring, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction is also an area where we as foreign language teachers can reinforce the work of the classroom teacher. An incident in one of the fifth grade classes clearly illustrates the carryover of content-based foreign language instruction to the regular classroom curriculum. During a math test, a student approached her teacher and said, I don't understand what this is asking for. What are factors? We haven't studied factors. And the teacher responded, oh yes, we have. We spent a lot of time on those. I don't remember it, said the student. At that point, the teacher said, ¿Cuáles son los factores de...? and the child's face lit up, returned to his seat, and completed that section of the test. Factors meant nothing to him in English, but when he heard the word factores, he knew just what to do. <laughs> we are also integrating our program with specific events. In the fourth grade, some French classes are learning about nocturnal animals in keeping with the upcoming theme week night. Jan Small's class had a lesson on logo in French, preparatory to their computer class on logo. In the fifth grade, during newspaper week, all of the Spanish classes were based on newspapers from Colombia and Puerto Rico. The fourth and fifth grade teachers have been very supportive of us and our attempts to achieve a partially content-based curriculum. They've included us in their grade level meetings and have offered suggestions as to ways in which we can reinforce their curriculum, and we really do appreciate their support. Next year. We're anticipating three sections of French and two of Spanish in the traditional eighth grade program. This will be the last year that we have a one-year foreign language program at the intermediate middle school. These figures are based on a survey of seventh grade students taken in January. We had an 85% return on the survey and extrapolating the figures that we received, we're expecting between 60 and 66 signing up for French and between 30 and 35 in Spanish. This will again be an entry-level course equivalent to the high school current level one class. In the seventh grade, we plan to offer both Spanish and French. This will be the first time students have a choice of languages, and whichever language they elect, they are expected to continue for seventh and eighth grade. We feel it's important to offer a choice of languages at this point. It isn't, earlier, it isn't possible in the earlier grades for administrative reasons. Our classes are only 20 minutes long, and it would be really unnecessarily disruptive to shuffle students from one room to another so that they could opt for Spanish or French. At the seventh grade level, however, students already have two or three teachers, and they are arming from class to class. Some of them may have very valid reasons for preferring one language over another, family heritage, study or travel plans, or a real interest in a specific part of the world where one of those languages is spoken and we would like to accommodate their preference where at all possible. 
In addition, by the end of sixth grade, the students who have had three years in the FLESS program will have acquired considerable language skills. Incoming students new to the system who haven't had the experience of FLESS will be at a significant disadvantage in the continuing French program next year. Offering a chance of the continuing FLESS French program or an entry-level program in Spanish at seventh grade allows us to accommodate the needs of incoming students. The Foreign Language Department 4 through 12 is currently at work on developing the courses of continuing French and entry-level French that will be offered in seventh grade next year. David Perry and Suzanne Janelle have offered to address this part of our presentation. I'm sure you have questions, but I think we're going to hold them until everyone's gone through so that if we answer them in the process, there's no duplication. I'm going to talk a bit about the theoretical framework of how we're drawing up the courses for actually all the courses 4 through 12, but specifically how we're looking at designing our courses in 7th and 8th grade. Traditionally, um, language courses are drawn up looking at what is the easiest point of grammar you can possibly teach to a student at a particular, particular level, and then going on to the next more difficult. And what happens is you have um, almost an inverse pyramid effect starting with one small kernel of knowledge here and building up with more and more complex structures. Um, the problem with this is that the structures are not always, always related, the grammar is not always related to what the um, needs are for communicating in the language. So for example, the easiest thing might be teaching um, articles, definite articles or indefinite articles, but they really have less of an importance when trying to communicate in the language than say other forms of the language. What we're doing now is trying to look at outcomes. What do we expect students to be able to do at the end of a certain amount of time? What should we expect of a fourth grade student after 20 minutes a day, five days a week, over a period of one year? What should we expect of a seventh grade student after the time they've put in? So we're looking at these behaviors in terms of communication. What type of speaking skills, especially, do we expect these students to be able to have? So we're calling these outcomes. And we've um, looked at, for example, what we expect out of uh, ninth grade students and what we've expected out of seventh, eighth, and ninth grade students coming out of the two different programs, coming out of FLESS and starting at the high school. We're basing this on work that's been done by the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages who've been working in conjunction with the uh, uh, Foreign Service Institute and Educational Testing in Princeton who've tried to draw, it up, draw up guidelines for measuring students' abilities in speaking, listening, writing, and reading. We've taken these guidelines that they've come up with along with um, the state curricula that have been uh, devised in Georgia and Wisconsin and adapting them to what our needs are here in Cape Elizabeth. What we're coming up for a final product is um, looking, at looking at what students can do with what they know as opposed to looking at what they know. A traditional language program, when the student finishes, perhaps they, they know a lot of book grammar. And this is something that parents constantly tell me when they come back. Gee, I took four years of French, but um, I can't speak it. Well, we're trying to turn that around. We're trying to come give our students um, some real concrete skills that they will take with them no matter how long they spend with us, whether they spend one, two, three, or four years with us, so that when they come back and see us 20 years from now, they can say, oh, yes, I took three years of Spanish, and I can still re remember some of the phrases that I used then. And, and actually, I was traveling in Mexico uh, last year, and it came back to me, and I was able to go to restaurants and order, and I was able to go into the hotel and talk to people. So our orientation now is, is more towards communication and what students can do and what we can expect them to be able to do at the end of certain amounts of time, as opposed to teaching them more abstract grammar. Um, Suzanne? is going to give you some, some specific examples of what people will be doing in the seventh and eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Let me expand a bit and uh, talk to you about the course design for seventh and eighth grade. 
Here are a few examples of the things we would like our students to be able to do. Students will be able to understand, answer, ask questions about personal experiences in the present, the past, and the future. Students will be able to express likes and dislikes. Students will be able to function in the foreign country and handle situations such as buying food, changing money, making a date, using the telephone. As David explained, the program emphasis will be on learning to use the language in meaningful ways rather than learning about the language. In the classroom, we will be using audio and video materials, role playing, skits, paired and group activities, all of which help develop speaking skills, listening skills. Those are some of the things that, some of the materials that we need to develop this summer during the curriculum work. Textbooks which match our goals have to be chosen. Ancillary materials such as role playing, paired exercises, video, audio materials have to be selected or developed to supplement the text. It's, if it's our goal for the students to develop proficiency, we need to be able to provide for them lots of opportunities to speak the language and to use it in a variety of situations. Um, Juan Perez will now come up and put a, some closure to what we've been talking about this evening and talk a bit about what's going to be happening at the high school as these new PLES students arrive. I was asked to be very brief, so I will. Uh, obviously, because of the growth of the uh, foreign language program in the uh, elementary school and middle school, the courses at the high school are going to have to be redesigned. Um, we're hoping that the emphasis would be in oral communication and proficiency. Students would be uh, uh, emphasized on, on the oral skills, ordering a restaurant, uh, mailing a package from a post office, uh, talking to a taxi cab driver uh, in Spain or in France. Uh, as a result of the uh, skills acquired earlier, uh, we envision that the students coming into the high school would have an ability level of uh, roughly a third year um, uh, ability uh, based in the high school. That would give us uh, also the possibility of two different sequences, one in language and the other in literature. Uh, obviously when you have uh, a certain number of kids, some of these kids are going to develop at a faster pace than others. Hopefully, some of the students would uh, find it interesting and challenging to go into a sequence of literature uh, versus language, uh, where they could study uh, contemporary uh, major writers in Latin America, and uh, therefore that would lead to an AP course, uh, either in language or in literature. Um, one of the exciting things that we're doing, uh, for example, Barbara and I are, uh, have plans. Uh, she's been visiting my classes, my Spanish three, and I have been visiting her. Uh, uh, fourth grade classes. Uh, we are trying to uh, redesign and structure a, a new course uh, where, whereby these kids that will be coming in at the uh, ninth grade will be able to take, for example, a uh, history of uh, Spanish culture and civilization, uh, and perhaps a survey of literature uh, at that level, uh, but geared to their uh, chronological age of uh, 14 or 15 years of age, because the course content that we have now is uh, more, uh, you know, uh, for an, adult, uh, an older, uh, an older uh, age. Uh, thank you. We're, we're very excited about uh, the, the possibilities that we can do with these kids. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you all. I have just one observation uh, for David. Uh, I think when the students come back uh, 20 years from now, I think we'd like some of them to say, uh, uh, one, for example, might say he set up uh, L.L. Bean's marketing department in France. Another one sold Unum's uh, insurance products in Latin America. And maybe somebody will come back someday and say he or she had been an ambassador to France or uh, Argentina. <laughs> Any questions? Are there questions? I think you all are planning ahead. We appreciate it. Those, it's a wonderful opportunity for the young people, and we're, we're happy that we've been able to implement this the last few years, and I'm glad to see the results of it carrying on and a lot of thought being given to the future. 
I think okay. the thing that that I was impressed with is the comment that somebody made before about the fact that they remember so much after the, the they haven't lost everything in the second year from the summer. I think I think I think Barbara mentioned before. I think that's that's exciting. I know there's uh, there's French around my house all the time, so that's that's fun. That's yeah, I was asked a question by my son about uh, half an hour before I came here in Spanish. I'm not sure in retrospect whether it was a put up job or not. <laughs> 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 Maybe I'll never know. <laughs> It's really one of the programs that, uh, that makes, uh, I think, Cape School unique. And I know Daryl's been a big supporter of it, and uh, it, it's not a program that comes cheaply, I might add, as I was sitting here running some numbers before, but when you look at the long range, I think it's a program that, uh, that's, that's really solid and very strong for the program. And I, and I think this probably is the right time to, to give credit where it's due, because I remember long before I was on a school board, the first meeting that you uh, spoke publicly. It was at the high school in early October and one of the first things Dr. Pelletier said was my one of my first goals is to see that uh, students are proficient in two languages when they graduate from high school and one of those may be English but the other should be another language and I think we're on our way to the goal and we thank you for that. We appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Michael. Great. Excuse me, uh, there is one more no, question. That's right, I don't mean Michael, but I just wanted to say on the agenda that, that goes home to the parents, I would appreciate it if, if there's going to be a change in a program, um, that that be reflected um, rather than just saying a report on, on the eighth grade language arts. Maybe it could say um, report on changes planned or suggested in, in eighth grade language arts. This was a request made last month. and. Uh, I think probably this is the only uh, item on the agenda that could have used some amplification this month, but I think we need to, Connie, when you're putting the minutes together, mm -hmm. think of it in terms of is this something new that, that needs some further elaboration so that the public will know exactly what will be happening on the evening of the school board. We, uh, as a matter of fact, we did this, Connie and the superintendent, and I'm not sure, I wasn't sure what to put after eighth grade language arts. But next time, I'll uh, delve into it a little few. As a matter of fact, uh, Connie uh, had an agenda that I said was uh, just too much. Probably not. <laughs> and, probably uh, not. So I we'll, think, I think we'll we the, the other, so next time often. we'll err the other side. I think probably you're so involved in the programs that you assume that they're right. understood, and they close. really aren't. Too close. They really aren't. So even if it means taking the agenda to the back of the sheet of paper, Okay. Go for it. You are right. All right, we will re return to the superintendent's report, and uh, I believe we begin with the special education site review. Right. This is a very brief re report. The special education uh, site review was three uh, uh, people from the State Department who spent two or three days here. It was an in-depth study. Uh, I attended the what they call the exit review and was extremely pleased to hear a very favorable report. And we should get that in writing in 30 days, the attorney told me. And uh, Madam Chairman, when we get that, I'll put it on the board agenda. But I just wanted you to know that I was very pleased with the report. All right, thank you. Uh, the report on the American Association of School Administrators Conference. Dr. Uh, Pelletier. I'm always pleased to uh, return from a a national uh, school administrator con conference to uh, appreciate what we have here at home. But I do want to say that uh, the speaker that most uh, interested me was the Honorable Elizabeth Dole, the Secretary to the U.S. Department of Labor. She indicated uh, the new programs and money that would be forthcoming from labor to education in an attempt to meet some of the President's new goals that are being published everywhere. All in all, it was one of the largest uh, conferences we've had, and it was exciting. And uh, the thing I liked was the strategic planning, the crying need. I bring to your attention that the, the next 10 to 20 years, you're going to see a very shortage of administrators in this country. And I think that's a, uh, something that we hopefully will give a lot of attention to. Uh, here with our new recertification and uh, I am hopeful that we can start to entice uh, women 
to look toward administration because uh, we're going to need them. And I say that because March is the month of women and my wife will be very pleased if she's listening. All right, uh, will you give us an update on the space needs? Recently? Yes, I only wanted to say uh, uh, in terms of space needs, uh, we s asked the board last time to uh, not postpone, but to include in the discussion of space needs uh, the budget. And if uh, you've been watching uh, for the last uh, few nights, we've certainly been doing a great deal in budget. We have not given up on space needs. Uh, the board has instructed us to start proceedings toward a portable. We have done that. At the same time, I believe the board uh, did a tour today. Uh, so I think at this time, uh, we haven't determined exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and we have uh, two or three more days in the budget. So I just wanted to make certain that we, we haven't lost uh, the report on space needs. We're still taking a hard look at that. We're meeting in the morning again, the Administrative Council, to review the latest reports along with some budgetary implications. I, I, think, I think you can go on record as saying that the board has, has decided against the eighth grade going to the high school. That, that's been stated publicly. So okay. we, we've had a lot of calls. Thank you for the calls. <laughs> They're very effective. <laughs> they are effective. Um, we are continuing to look at, at all the other aspects. Um, and, and if you're able to come to any of the budget workshops, particularly the one Saturday, which will probably be an all-day workshop, um, I think as we get a total look at the budget, uh, we'll be ready to make a decision. And we, and we are still gathering information and had a, a good walkthrough with the, uh, the contractor today looking at the middle school uh, proposal that they presented to us, that, that we were presented with last month. Uh, and I think we, we got a good picture of, of the feasibility of that. But by the next board meeting, we'll be ready to tell you what we're going to do. Um, and hopefully it won't be anything too dramatic. That's our hope. All right. Uh, Lastly, uh, Madam Chairman, I'd like to bring to your attention something the Town Council in Freeport has asked me to bring to the Board of Education. As you all know, there's a fiscal crisis by rescinding or cutting back on the previously approved state funds available to Freeport and other municipalities. Uh, this is a resolution to uh, urge the legislature to uh, find some way to increase the taxes so that it will not affect the property tax. I bring this to your attention. It's a, a resolution by them and it's being circulated around the state. And at the same time, I bring to your attention uh, the school funding coalition that was formed uh, only this week. And this is the school boards, uh, the superintendents of schools, the uh, Maine Teachers Association, the Principals Association, Maine Secondary School Association, together have reached the conclusion that we should jointly advocate for students by taking the position that no reduction should be made in education subsidies and other state funding designated to relieve local property taxes. So I bring this to your attention because I believe on the 20th of March, the legislature is going to see busload after busload of uh, citizens urging them to reinstate the amounts of money. And as you know, if the formula holds, that means around 70 plus thousand for us. So I bring it to your attention. I think this bulletin goes on to state that it would be helpful for us to uh, be in touch with the legislators who represent us and go on record as, as letting them know that this funding is essential. And so I, I would like for the board to do that. I'd like for Connie, we'll compose a letter and we will, if, if we're all in agreement that, that, uh, that we need our funding back, then we'll write a letter to our, our legislators and, uh, and state that and, and hopefully we'll get the teachers union to sign it with us and, and our superintendent and, and we will send that on to our, our local legislator. All right, we'll move on to the board chairman's report. Uh, two weeks ago, I had 
a wonderful opportunity of joining our elementary teachers, some of our elementary teachers and administrators at a national elementary consortium that was held before the uh, ASCD meeting in San Antonio. Uh, this group of elementary schools is composed of around 35 elementary schools throughout the continental United States, Alaska, and Hong Kong. And they met for three days and talked about educational issues, present and in the future. Uh, there were wonderful speakers, authors, college educators who talked with us. Um, much of the time was spent talking about whole language, cooperative learning, uh, ways to uh, address reading needs early. I think it was a program called Reading Recovery. Um, we met some very, very interesting people uh, who are so involved in education. We are the new people in this group. We are the, the newest addition. And I, I would like to think that we were chosen uh, fractionally because of our location in Maine, but mostly because of uh, the, the way that our administration must have presented our school system uh, when we made application to become part of this group. Uh, I found that we're doing a lot of things right and according to uh, what's known to be best and most effective in education, we're in there. And I think we have things to teach the other schools and much to learn from them. And some of our educators, uh, Nancy Hutton and Susan Welch, were able to give uh, a presentation to the group one afternoon. And um, I did not attend that because I wanted to go to another presentation, which I felt might be helpful. I already knew what our educators had to offer. And uh, I heard wonderful feedback from people. Uh, the next day about the quality of the report that our own educators had given. It was, a, it was a really uh, one of the nicest things I've been able to do since joining the board, and I was so pleased to be a part of that. Uh, I was able to interface with other school board members and chairmen. Uh, it was an opportunity to network with other schools. I'll send you my report cards, you send me yours. Uh, you know, a lot of sharing. And I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for our school to be a part of this program, and I wanted to share that with you. That's what a fine opportunity it was. They meet twice a year, and uh, next year we'll be meeting in New Jersey. And uh, that, we drive down there and, and, uh, and continue to, to share and to grow. All right, old business. Consideration of changes in a school board policy, child abuse and neglect. This came up in October and has undergone such revision that we really consider, even though it's under old business, I think we'll have to consider it a new policy because I don't think you'll find it recognizable in its, in its uh, former form. Dr. Pelletier, would you like to comment on this, please? Yes, I'd like to. Uh, I'm extremely pleased with the uh, final uh, version of the child abuse and neglect policy. And, uh, as the chairman said, this probably should constitute the first reading, and if it does, on the second reading, I'd like to present to the board the program document that will go with this that will be in the teacher's handbook. And that's an extensive document, and there's been a lot of work on that. And I think, Madam Chairman, you would agree that we probably should give some credit to Gail Parker, who helped us uh, develop this. And uh, I think it's a model, a policy. And uh, if, if it's, it'll come up again next time, and we'll give you an opportunity to see the program document. That, of course, will be for the teachers, but I'm sure you'd like to take a hard look at it. Right. Are there questions about the policy? Jan? I have uh, one on page three at the top, number eight. The principal or superintendent may notify the child's parents or custodian that a written report has been made to the department does that mean that they don't necessarily have to be notified? It's by choice? Right. Why, why is it that way instead of they, they will be notified? I'm just curious. The, uh, that's the recommendation that was given to us by the attorney and the professor that was teaching the course. There may be times when you may not want to notify the parents. Perhaps it's a very adverse uh, 
consequences for the child. Okay. They, they would eventually be notified, but not through the school. It, it would be probably when, through, through the state, it would come from them. Yeah, it, it is the law. It was negotiable. Any other? What specifically was changed from the previous? I mean, I didn't pull the old document to compare. And we have removed all the underlining. Okay. We, we would have to go right back to the source. Probably uh, about six or eight things. Okay. I, I think that we, we could do that for you next time, but we, we have to go back to the, where we were. There have been two underlying changes, and this is the final. And we wanted to do it clean. Okay. We'll get that information for okay. you. Thank you sir. Other, other questions? No further questions. All right. Well, we will. We will put. Yes. No. All right. Well, then we will put this aside until next meeting, where it will be approved or disapproved. Uh, under old business, uh, the consideration of a superintendent's nomination of a continuing contract teacher. Yes, I'm more than happy to present only one this evening, uh, and that is uh, Gretchen Berg for uh, a continuing contract. All right, do I hear a motion that we accept Gretchen Berg? I would like to place a motion, the nomination of Gretchen Berg for a continuing contract. All right, and seconded. Second by Mr. Leslie. All right, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, then we move on to uh, further into new business. A ratification of the Secretary's AIDS and Pond Cove Administrative Assistant contract. We've asked the co-presidents of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association to be present at this meeting to sign the contracts along with the President's School Board. And I see them in the front rows. And when they come up and we'll have them sign with the chairman and probably give them my pen. <laughs> we still keep. You better be careful. We haven't finalized the budget yet. Here, the contract's in the chair. You can go along here. It's in the back here. There are two. There you go. You can keep it. Does it have a prison? That's what Lyndon Johnson told us, Deb. Representing the Te Teachers Association are the co-presidents, uh, Mrs. Aneen Stanford and Mr. Sam Boothby. And we thank both of them for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I think, who, who are the school board members that work so hard on this? Mr. Holt and Mr. Greer. Mr. Holt and Mr. Greer. Thank you both very much for your hard work. Our chief negotiators here. It was a pleasure. All right. Um, we have a re request to raise prices of the hot lunches. Right. The request to raise price of the hot lunch program in grades K-8 from $1.15 to $1.25 for students and from $1.75 to $2.00 for adults Effective March 19th, 1990. Now, uh, D has made a, a report on two occasions. You've read the paper. Uh, we're not alone. 
And uh, if this is passed, we will send a notification to parents immediately that uh, this would become in effect at that date. We need a resolution on this. And it's for discussion, Madam Chairman. All right, I hear discussion. I, I think I heard you say earlier this could, will raise approximately $6,000 in revenue per year, six to $7,000 in correct. revenue. That's correct. Which still puts us at a 30,000 plus shortfall. That's correct. I think it's, it's not, we're reaching the point that we have to admit that we must subsidize our lunch program. Is that uh, fair to all agree? I think it's a fair statement and, I, and uh, checking with other school districts, uh, what some of them have done in, in the past is, is they have subsidized them, but they're finding that, you know, that ten or fifteen thousand dollars they put aside is just not enough to cover the cost. Some districts where, you know, the enrollments are, you know, twenty five hundred students or better are going to their, their local communities and asking like for fifty, sixty, seventy to hundred thousand dollars to put in the budgets. It's big it's big business. Now will you be bringing this to us as a budget item Saturday? It is. It's part of the budget under the uh, district-wide support accounts. There's no change in the milk, individual milk prices, right? We raised Flashes that milk. this year. We, didn't we raise that? So, good but question. But that's not going to be reflected in any increase in this increase. <laughs> Should, okay. Questions? Okay, do I hear a motion to increase the price of a hot lunch in grades K through eight from $1.15 to $1.25 for students and from $1.75 to $2 for adults? So moved. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Holt and seconded by Mr. Leslie. All in favor? Consideration of superintendent's nomination for second year probationary teachers. All right, Madam Chairman, you have uh, the list of uh, teachers, and I'll read those very quickly. I'm very pleased to present these. Sarah Lewis, kindergarten. Josephine Moran, grade one. Anne Calandro, grade three. Kelly Manahan, grade three. Ogden Williams, grade three. Gary Record, grade three, Carolyn Sloan, grade four, Annette Solobello, grade five, Susan Janelle, half-time French, Spanish, Sherry Robinson, librarian, Janet Favor in special education, Beth Weir in speech therapist. Those were in the elementary school. In the middle school, Paul Casey, grade six, Susan Terrian, art, six through eight, Randall Perkins, Industrial Arts, and Linda Hull, Halftime Language Arts. In the high school, Gilbert Donatelli, Music, Elaine Brownell, Halftime Teacher Math, and Greg Clark, Physical Science, Halftime. Okay, do I hear a motion that we extend second year probationary teacher contracts to the people whose names have just been read? So move. Mr. Leslie? Second by Mrs. Solon. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed. Okay. Consideration of a resignation. Uh, the superintendent's recommendation is that the board accept the request for resignation of Nancy Miles, special education resource room teacher in grades four through five. Okay, do you I have her letter. Yes. Move do we accept the resignation? Do I hear a second? Second. All right, any discussion? I, I would like to say that although Ms. Miles has only been with our school system one year, it's been amazing how many people that she has worked with that I, I've heard from their families saying what a fine job she was doing and, and, um, and I know she'll be missed and would have been a fine addition to our staff. And we, we will, uh, we're losing someone that, that we, are, uh, are sorry to see go and wish her well in, in her uh, pursuits. All in favor? We already done that? <laughs> no, I think that was during discussion. <laughs> All opposed? <laughs> Fine. 
Um, I think that concludes everything on our agenda except a consideration of a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purposes of discussing personnel matters. So moved. Second. 920. At 920. All in favor? Okay. Meeting is adjourned. We can have that right here. I just want to tell you. Sorry. Madam Chairman, we can have that right here. I just want to give you one no. second. Let you have this. No. You've got something.